Let's continue with section 2.4, graphing polynomial functions. Before we start, let us think about what we already know that we will apply for this section. So let's, think of, let's take a look at a linear function, y equals mx plus b. And we have a graph, it usually looks like a line, right? So our graph can go either up or down, something like that. We've also heavily worked with quadratics, something like y equals uh, x squared. And our graph typically looks like something like this. Well, we're going to work with this section is the end behavior. Notice that for a linear function, our endpoints are pointing opposite direction. This one's pointing down, while this one's forever is going up. And for parabolas, they both are pointing in the same direction. They both are pointing up. This is end behavior. For the linear function, we see that our x is to the first power, and number one, so this is the first power, that number one is an odd number. So this is traits that we'll see for an odd function. And for a quadratic, that two, exponent of two, is an even number. And this will be a feature that we'll see for even functions. And we'll describe this more in detail for this section. So let's read our objectives. First, we want to talk about end behavior of polynomial functions. Then recall some pieces about x and y intercepts. X intercepts, that's the same as your zeros. Talk about multiplicities. And lastly, we want to put that all together in graph. To begin, characteristics of a polynomial function. To begin our discussion on graphing polynomial functions, we are going to discuss the end behavior of algebraic functions. To describe end behavior, we must use notation from the following chart. So we have an x, x on the line with a negative infinity. We read that as x approaching negative infinity. And that is when on your line, you're looking at the numbers that are left, your x's that are negative. Next line, I have x arrow infinity. We read this as x approaches infinity. And that's the right end of the graph. So the right side for our x values. Next we have f of x arrow negative infinity. We read this as f of x approaches negative infinity. And this is direction of your graph. So when your graph is pointed downward. And then we have next row, f of x arrow infinity. We read this as f of x approaches infinity. And that's a graph when it's pointing downward or going downward. We have previously studied linear and quadratic functions without mentioning the words end behavior, but the end behavior was always controlled by the leading coefficient. Linear functions with degree one can always be written in the form f of x equals mx plus b, where the leading coefficient, the slope, is either positive or negative. So here we, we have two graphs. Let's focus on the first one. We have g of x equals 4x minus 6. And we have two different things going on. We have our arrows here and here. So here we have our leftmost side of our graph. And we see that it's pointing downward. And then we also have our rightmost part of the graph. And it's pointing upward. So this is how we would see it and interpret it in English using what we see. We're going to next talk about the notation. So if we read, if we continue reading, using our notation, the end behavior for g of x equals 4x minus 6, which is our graph above, the linear function of degree 1 with a positive leading coefficient can be described as follows f of x equals negative infinity, sg of x equals negative infinity. And what that's referring to is this part right here. 
this leftmost part, that is your x as it's approaching negative infinity because it's for the negative values. And it's pointing downward. So we say that g of x is approaching negative infinity. Now the next line says, as x is approaching positive infinity, g of x is approaching positive infinity. So the same for our rightmost part, as x is approaching positive infinity, because these are the x values are getting higher, our graph is pointing upward. So our graph, which we labeled g of x, is going upward. So it's going to positive infinity. So this is how we directly can translate these phrases from English to our math notation. So let's take a look at our next graph. Let's focus on the endpoints. So we have our arrows here and here. Let's first write in English so we can easily translate it. So we see that this leftmost part is for our x values as they're getting smaller, so negative infinity. So this is for our leftmost side, and we see that our graph is going to continue going upward. Now let's focus on our other end. Our rightmost side, and this is focusing on the sides that are getting bigger for x. As x gets bigger, we see that our arrow is going down more. So we would say our rightmost side is steeping downward. All right, so let's translate this into notation. Our leftmost side, so as our x's are approaching smaller numbers, negative infinity, our function, which we labeled f of x, f of x is going down. So, oh, it's going up, sorry, up. So we write positive infinity. Now on the other end point, our rightmost side, so as our x values are getting bigger, our function, which we labeled f of x, is going downward, so negative infinity. I hope this helps you keep this idea handy, especially with this notation, since I know it's new. That's what we want to see. So if you write left up, or leftmost point going upward, or rightmost point going downward, I'll know what you mean. You have to be familiar with this notation and write the notation. Now let's take a look at parabolas. We must realize that this will be the end behavior of every line with a negative slope and a leading coefficient. This will continue to be true for every polynomial of odd degree and a negative coefficient. Now let's consider parabolas from section 1.3. So let's take a look at this first graph. If we focus on the end behavior, we can write a summary, right? Like our leftmost point is going up and our rightmost point is going up. So we can translate it as x is approaching negative infinity. Our function, which is labeled f of x, f of x is approaching positive infinity. And we don't have to write the positive. We can just write infinity. And for the other end point, our rightmost point pointing upward, we can write it as x is approaching infinity, f of x is approaching infinity, both being positive. Now, keep in mind that our leading coefficient, it was positive, right? So the lack of a negative lets us know it's positive, and that's a big hint to let us know that our graph opens upward. Similar to our next graph. Now let's take a look at g of x. I start with a negative. So because I have a negative, I know that my graph opens downward. And I know that there'll be two arrows pointing down. And that's an important feature of our end behavior. So for this, we would say that as x is approaching negative infinity, our function, which is f of x, is approaching negative infinity. And as x is approaching positive infinity, 
our function f of x is approaching negative infinity. Oh, that was g of x. So g, not f. And you can see that in your notes as well. They kind of took a shortcut for f for x. They just wrote as x is approaching for the positive or negative, our f was the same. So you can write it in one shot. So now let's write a summary of what we've learned so far. Before, this will be true for every polynomial of odd degree with a negative leading coefficient. I think they meant even degree because we just talked about parabolas. All right, let's write a quick summary of the end behavior. So what we talked about lines and parabolas will hold true for every polynomial of the same degree. A line has an odd degree and a parabola has an even degree. And the end behavior will follow the same for any degree that's even and odd. So first, when I have an odd degree polynomial, you, the, your lean coefficient is positive, your leftmost point will point down and your rightmost point will point up. In between can vary from polynomial to polynomial. Next, if I have an odd degree and I have a negative lean coefficient, your leftmost point will point up and your rightmost point will point down. If I have an even degree polynomial that's pointing positive, think of a parabola. A parabola with a positive number in the beginning, they both point up. So same thing for any polynomial. And lastly, when I have an even polynomial with a negative degree, my end behavior will point down. Example one. Determine the end behavior for f of x equals negative x to the fourth power minus 10x to the third power minus 28x squared minus 6x plus 45. So what I'm looking for and what I want to focus on is mainly the leading coefficient. Because this polynomial is fully expanded, we see that there's no numbers in parentheses. Our leading number tells us a lot. So here we see that we start with a negative, and our leading exponent, our degree of our polynomial, is 4, which is even. So I know that our end behavior, they're both going to be pointing downward. What's happening in between? I don't know. Maybe something like a W, a couple of waves going on. We'll talk about that soon. But I know my end behavior will both be pointing downward. So our answer would be the degree is 4, which is even, and the lean coefficient is negative. So the end behavior can be described in the same manner as a parabola opening downward. They're both pointing down, right? So as x is approaching negative infinity, our function f of x is approaching negative infinity. And as x is going to the right, positive infinity, our function f of x is opening down to negative infinity. Or you can write it quicker this way. Since our function is opening the same way, negative infinity for both x to the positive and negative side. Let's skip to example three. Determine the end behavior of f of x equals 2x, 2 times x minus 3 times x plus 1 squared times 4x minus 1. Let's read from our text. In order to determine the end behavior, we need to know the degree and leading coefficient of the function. We consider the leading term of each of the factors as follows. So we need to consider our leading number and then each factor as it is. So I have x minus 3, 
x plus 1 squared, that one counts twice, and 4x plus 1. So I need to see each degree. So this is degree 1. This, because it's squared, we degree 2. And this one has degree 1. I have to sum up all my factors to help you find your degree. So this polynomial is degree 4. So we know that it's even degree, and our leading number is positive, with a positive leading coefficient. So it has the same end behavior as a parabola pointing upward. Now the leading term of f of x would be the product of the terms of all the factors. Therefore, f of x equals, essentially, an even number to the times x to the even power. The degree is 4, which is even, and the leading coefficient is positive. So the end behavior can be described in the same manner as a parabola opening upward. All right, let's continue. Now that we can determine the end behavior of a polynomial function, we will begin the process of finding key points of a polynomial functions, namely intercepts. So let's recall intercepts. To find our x-intercept, which are points that cross our x-axis, we have to go ahead and let our other letter be 0. So let y equal 0. To find our y-intercept, we have to let our other letter be 0, so let x equal 0. And this will give you points that will cross your x-axis, which is the line that goes left and right, and our y-axis, which is the line that goes up and down. And we're going to continue with the same four examples in which we discussed the end behavior, but now we'll continue to determine the y-intercept. Just as a linear quadratic function, finding the y-intercept requires letting x, letting x equal 0. So let's do example one. Determine the y-intercept. All right, what's nice about when it's fully factored, and it's probably about the only thing that makes it nice, is that finding your y-intercept is easy. Any number that's multiplied by zero will be gone, it'll be zero, so that you're just left with their constant. So our y-intercept, and we see the work below, will be 45. But when it's factored, like example 3, that's not the case. I actually have to go ahead and work out, make every x a 0 and work it out. So we see the work, and you can take the time to calculate it. You get a y-intercept of 6. So our y-intercept is 0, 6. All right, now let's go ahead and find the x-intercepts. If you recall from earlier sections in this chapter, finding the x-intercept by letting f of x equal 0 is the same question as finding all the zeros of the function. The only difference between the zeros of a polynomial function and the x-intercepts is that we can have, have non-real complex numbers of 0, but they will not yield x-intercepts. Only real numbers will be x-intercepts. Now the word real, it's not talking about fake versus real. Real means numbers that are negative, positive, zero. They can be whole numbers, fractions, decimals. Those are real numbers. Now complex numbers, like 2 plus 3i, or just 3i, they do not produce a point that's an intercept. There's still a zero, but they're an imaginary zero, mainly because we have our Cartesian plane, and we have x values and y values. They're positive and negative and everything in between, but nowhere are there i's. There's no i values. So that's what makes them not a plottable point. All right, example one. So section 2.3 is very handy. For example 1, we have a polynomial that cannot be factored. So we have to go ahead 
and start by using our rational zeros theorem and create a list of possible factors. All right, now we can test each one using synthetic division. And remember, your goal is to get zero as a last number. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with one. One produces a zero remainder. So that means it evenly divides our polynomial. So we have now broken down our polynomial to have x equals negative, or x minus one. Yes, I know we have a positive one, but we write it in parentheses as x minus one because this technically means x equals one. And if we work it backwards, we get x equal x minus one. And then our answer has produced a part of our answer. So this is negative x cubed minus 11x squared minus 39x minus 45. All right, we conti continue with synthetic division using our reduced form. We try negative 1, which does not produce a 0. We continue with negative 3, and we get a 0. So now we know. From the very beginning one, which is no longer on my screen, I have x minus 1. Now we have x plus 3. Remember, the sign changes when we write it back in parentheses. And this gives us negative x squared minus 8x minus 15. OK, now we reached a quadratic. What's nice about a quadratic is I can try to factor or use quadratic formula. We can also, since we have that leading negative, I can factor it out to have x minus 1, x plus 3. Let's write that negative that we're going to factor and change the signs x squared plus 8x plus 15 and try to factor. And we see that this fully factors to be here. Negative x minus 1 times x plus 3, and our quadratic factor to be x plus 3 times x plus 5. We see that our x plus 3s, those repeated, so we can write them together with the exponent square. Now let's talk multiplicity. So this x minus 1 has an exponent of 1, so this one has a multiplicity of 1. This x plus 3 has a square, so this one has a multiplicity of 2. And x plus 5 only repeats once, so we have a multiplicity of 1. So we can set them at equal to 0, which we have here, and label each multiplicity. So we have x equals 1 with a multiplicity of 1, x equals negative 3 with a multiplicity of 2, and x equals negative 5 with a multiplicity of 1. So just to make sure we're on the right track, I'll do one of them. So we have x minus 1, we set it equal to 0, and we solve for x. We add 1 to both sides, we get x equals 1. Because this only repeated once, we say it has a multiplicity of 1. So that's what we have right here. All right, let's move forward. You can take a look at those on your, on your own. You have all the work there. As a final step, before we can graph functions, we must discuss the role of multiplicities when graphing a polynomial function. The multiplicity of each zero will affect what graph does at the x-intercept associated with that zero. So let me get to the punchline. What's going to happen is, so say we have some x-intercept. I'll do two. When you have a multiplicity that's even, when you get that zero and you cross it, it's going to bounce. So it can bounce upward, or it can touch it and bounce downward. Also, what may happen is, if you have a multiplicity that's odd, when you touch a zero, it's going to go from, it's going to fully cross it. You can cross it that way or cross it this way. And that's 
the multiplicity, the role it plays on your x-intercepts. So when it's even, I'd like to think of it as um, touching or bouncing off the x-intercept. And when it's odd, we cross it. So hopefully that helps you remember. Let's continue with our text. Consider the function p of x equals negative x minus 1 times x plus 4 squared. Now let's look at the multiplicity. This one has the multiplicity of 1. And because it has a square, it has a multiplicity of 2. So we have two x-intercepts. We set each one equal to 0. x minus 1 equals 0. We add 1 to both sides. We get x equals 1. And we have x plus 4 equals 0. We add 4 to both sides. We get x equals 4. And each one has a multiplicity. The first one has a multiplicity of 1 and the other has a multiplicity of 2, which we have here, written. The x-intercept 1, 0 came from the 0 x equals 1 with a multiplicity of 1. Let's see what happens to our function near the x-intercept of 1, 0, specifically with the sign of our function values. Consider x equals 0 to the left hand of x equals 2 to the right hand. When we plug in 0, we get a negative number. and we plug in 2, we get a positive number. So we know it's going to change. With inputs close to the x-intercept of 1, 0, the value of the function changes from a negative sign on the left to the positive on the right because of the factor changes. So let's take a look at our answer. Oh, what does it show us? So it's showing, it's trying to emphasize that when we have the zero at one, it's going to go from zero, which was negative, to two, which is positive. So, so it shows that at this value, it crosses from the negative side to the positive side. And this shows that for 4, if we plug in a number that's smaller and bigger, for negative 5, it's negative. So it's somewhere down here. And when I plug in a negative 3, it's still negative. So it never crosses the x-axis. It just touches it or bounces off it. In general, if the x-intercept comes to a zero of an odd multiplicity, the graph will go through the x-intercept. As I like to say, it crosses it. If the x-intercept of a zero from a zero of even multiplicity, the graph will bounce off the x-intercept. Graphs of polynomial functions. So we worked so hard to get here. This is the end piece of the graphing. We now have all the building blocks needed to graph polynomial functions. But before we begin, there are two details about polynomial graphs we need to be, that need to be mentioned. First, the domain of every polynomial function is all real numbers, from negative infinity to positive infinity. So the graph of every polynomial function will be one continuous curve. Continuous meaning we never pick up our pen. So our graph can look something like this. Secondly, the curve will be a smooth curve without any sharp points. Let's begin with a graph of four examples discussed in this section. Graph 1. Graph f of x equals negative x to the fourth power minus 10x cubed minus 28x squared minus 6x plus 45. And we did all this work. We found our y-intercept plus 45, our x-intercepts, we found them in another part of the example. And we know the end behavior. So this is what we have so far. We have our y-intercept. We have our x-intercepts. 
and we have our end behavior. So now I just need to know what's going on in between. And from here, I typically just feel comfortable connecting these pieces. So I have to label the multiplicity to know what's going on. I know negative, uh, negative 5 has a multiplicity of 1. So I know it's going to cross. Let's write a note to know to cross. At negative 3, we see it has a multiplicity of 2, so I know it's going to bounce. And at 1, it has a multiplicity of 1, so I know it's going to cross. All right, let's begin graphing with that green and um, helpful hint. So I can start from the left, best, left end point. When I get to my x-intercept, I know I'm going to cross it. And I have to go back down to 3 when I will bounce off. And then cross my other point. So that's a rough sketch. Let's try it again and make sure we include our, our y-intercept. So we're going to cross, bounce, make sure to touch your y-intercept, and cross again. That's a quick sketch of our graph. Now we can draw the graph function from the left to right using multiplicities. The graph goes through the x-intercept at negative 5 bounces off at negative 3 and includes the y-intercept, and lastly, crosses off 1. So that's our answer, our official answer, which is really close to our sketch, which makes me very happy. So let's make an outline of what you need to do to graph. You first want to know your end behavior. Write a note of that. Second, you want to find your x and y intercepts. And x intercepts are your zeros, which is the very complex part that takes up a lot of time. And lastly, you want to make a list of your multiplicities. Meaning, does it cross? Does it bounce off that zero? That's important. And once you have all those pieces, you can go ahead and put them together to connect your graph. All right, that's it for this section. There's more examples. For every example you saw earlier, there's a graph to it. I think with what we've covered, you're able to follow the instructions, the guidance from your notes on your own. Thanks.